All right. Hi, everyone. Uh, this is Faye from Face World Media. And today I have David G joining me. Oh, hello. Uh, hello. I'm so excited. For some of you who don't know David G as well, I'm going to just do a very quick intro. And I've also included uh, links in the description below for you to check out his books and uh, you know his profile, Insight Timer, where I have followed him for years. Um, so David G has dedicated his life to teaching people to connect to the stillness and silence that rests within to help them heal their heart, find their voice and step into their power. Um, so there's a longer intro that I've included, but I just want to take a moment and express my gratitude to you, David G, that you came into my life six years ago in 2016 when I first discovered uh, the Inside Timer app. And my life hasn't been the same. And as a creator, based on what, you, what I just said in a couple of sentences, I feel like you are one of the very most important people who um, helped me find my stillness, find my voice, my creativity, and really be here to play the long game. So thank you so much. Wow. Well, thank you so much. I'm so excited to be here with you. And so uh, thank you for inviting me. It's my, it's my pleasure and my joy uh, to be here. Oh. I am so privileged because typically when I invite someone uh, I love, admire on the show, sometimes it's the first time ever for me to like meet them on screen or to have a chat. But the reality is that you and I have connected twice, uh, you know, face to face like this. But I feel like your voice has uh, been echoing in my head for six years. And as I'm posting this live stream, I found out that, you know, there are some of my followers who have been listening, learning from you from the, the Hay House uh, radio days. And that was you know, really surprised me. So you, you have a very wide reach there. Um, <laughs> what is it like to be kind of a ce celebrity is not maybe not the right word, but the way that I feel like you are um, seen is, you know, you're one of the most known, well-known meditation teachers uh, out there. What, how does that, what does it feel like? <laughs> Feels great feels great. It's a little weird um, when I'm in the supermarket because I have to like put on a hoodie and glasses. Um, being masked up was was great for two years because, um, you know, whenever I'm in the supermarket, some supermarket, it doesn't really even matter where, but, you know, mm. or in a restaurant, people, you know, always want to take pictures of what's in my cart <laughs> or, or what I'm or what I'm eating. Um, <clears throat> they don't want, you know, they didn't. They're like, oh, I don't want to take a selfie with you. I just want to take a picture of what's in your cart. I'm like, whatever. Okay. Um, so it's great. It's great. Um, I know I'm a little weird looking. Um, and um, so I think uh, everyone who pays attention to me sort of like it embraces my my kook. Mm. My kooky. I, I mean, people who follow you love a lot of these things, all, pretty much I think all of you and um, that level of uniqueness and I think self-acceptance and and I don't think, I never felt like you created this persona more as I've always felt like it's always been part of you. Am I correct or you've come from a very different background? Um, <clears throat> well, you know, uh, I learned to read um, very, very early on. My mother um, had a Ouija board and so, <laughs> we would actually use the Ouija board um, for reading. And my mother was, uh, my mother's an artist, a sculptor and a painter, um, you know, and so at an early age, she was, you know, bringing me to the New York Philharmonic and to, you know, all the great museums um, in New York. Mm -hmm. And, um, and I really headed off in a direction where I was going to be a, um, uh, either a philosopher or a writer. Those are the two things that I that I took when I went to philosophy and and and, um, and literature in college. Uh, but when I came out of college, um, my first job was as the director of public information for the Skin Cancer Foundation. So I learned everything about skin and and skin cancer. Um, you know, a little weird. Um, but um, one of the perks of that job was that I was given all these amazing creams that were very, very expensive. So anytime I was hanging out with, you know, anyone, whether it was my grandmother or on a date, I'd be like, oh, by the way, I have some special cream for your face um, to make you stay younger, or look younger. So that was fun. Um, but very, very quickly, um, 
you know, I asked for a raise at, at some point and they were like, yeah, in five years, we'll give you a raise. Um, and I was making, you know, I don't know, it's probably like $14,000 a year or something like that. N a non-sustainable you know, mm -hmm. life, lifestyle. And so then I got involved, uh, a friend of mine said, hey, you know what, I'm a bond trader and why don't you become a bond trader? And I'm like, okay. Uh, so, so I did that and that just led me off into a very, very deep world of, um, of fixed income securities and mergers and acquisitions. I was a mergers and acquisitions advisor for a bunch of years, worked in the World Trade Center, uh, worked with Aon, it's, it's a company that still exists. Um, mm -hmm. And um, then at a certain point, uh, all that ended. And um, I headed off on my own little journey of eat, pray, love without the eating or the love, just a lot of prayer. <laughs> and um, it sort of got me on this, this path. Um, when I was in college, I took an experimental Asian studies course, mm -hmm. and that was great. Um, that really locked in my meditation practice. I understood the mechanics and certainly from, from a certain perspective, really, you know, grew to, to love that. Um, but our it was a Zen meditation. Our teacher was a Zen master, and so uh, we were instructed to um, raise. You know, we just really just meditated most of the time, but we were instructed to raise our hands when we had a thought. And it's in in his hands. He carried an eighteen inch bamboo stick known as a kesaku, and so when we raised our hands, he would actually come over and thwack us on the back. Now. In our society these days, that's like a $20 million lawsuit. I could have been set if only that. <laughs> um, but instead I dropped the class and, and moved on. And um, so I loved meditation, got into candle gazing and Vipassana and mindfulness and mantra and Tantra, um, got into chocolate tasting meditation, which is really, you know, I still practice that one um, to this day. And for me, that was, um, you know, pretty amazing. And then as I got more deeply involved in the corporate world, <clears throat> Um, you know, that whole thing just uh, vanished <laughs> in my life. That was, it was gone. And um, so I figured, okay, um, let me, you know, also what was gone was balance in my life. I was really very, very aware of that. And so I was very reactive. I felt empty, I felt hollow. And um, in the wake of 9-11, uh, I worked on the, uh, uh, 82nd floor of Tower 2 for a bunch of years. And in the wake of 9-11, I was walking past a row of cardboard boxes that people were living in, in Southern Manhattan. And this guy pulled me into his box as I walked past this box and peered into my eyes. And he said, what's gonna be on your tombstone? And that was a fairly reflective moment. I call those butterfly moments. Cause in that moment, which seemed like eternity and it was probably three minutes mm -hmm. uh, where we had this dialogue, um, all the traffic stopped, all the people mm -hmm. stopped, all the sound stopped, every single thing stopped. We were like timeless. And, you know, who knows what even that was? Was that God speaking to me through some person? Was that this person who was here, you know, a bodhisattva disguised as a, as a person living in a cardboard box? Don't know. But that's really where I, you know, what is going to be on my tombstone? Um, mm -hmm. You know, tears were streaming down my face. I was hyperventilating. My knees were weak. And so um, I just headed off on my own little journey to find all the answers, searching for the guru. Ultimately went to India for six months, searching for the guru. Mm. Uh, went up to visit His Holiness the Dalai Lama in Dharamsala. He wasn't there that day. Um, traveled to, to the South, bathed in the Ganges, meditated, practiced yoga, read the Bhagavad Gita every single day. Got a whole bunch of Bhagavad Gitas right here, wow. by the way. Just a, just a few mixed in with the four agreements. Um, so anyway, um, and it was really while I was laying in a, uh, a hammock in a cashew forest in Kerala, reading the Bhagavad Gita for the, I don't know, 500th time where I read chapter two, verse 48, where God Krishna says to Arjuna, the great, greatest warrior of all, of all time, who's at a crossroads in his life, that I was at a crossroads in my life. And, uh, you know, Arjun is asking God, these are the first conversations with God around 300 BC. Um, how am I supposed to live my life? How am I supposed to walk through the world? And Krishna, God replies, yoga stakuru karmani. Establish yourself in the present moment and then perform action. And that hit me like a lightning bolt. And that was just like, 
that's it. And so I've been, you know, that was my aha moment. The guru rests inside. Here mm -hmm. I was searching all these months for this external thing. And, but the guru rests inside. In fact, the answers to every single question we could ever ask rests inside. We just have to quiet ourselves down enough so we can hear the whispers of our mm -hmm. heart. So we can hear the whispers of the divine. And so that's been my quest, you know, sort of, kind of, ever mm -hmm. since. Mm, my goodness. I, when I read about your experience in New York, uh, working in banking and, and bond trading, I was so blown away. And now you put a timeline to it right around, you know, 2000, 2001. That's mind blown because mind blowing because I think of you as someone who's kind of always lived this life. First of all, I think a lot of people haven't really asked or fully understand what David G means. Uh, Actually, I still didn't look close enough to to realize like how did the name come about? It you know what what is that? Was there a meaning? Is it a construct to it or? Um, yeah, um, funny enough. Um, so uh, after I got back from India, I was just like sitting and meditating for like six seven hours a day. That's what I was doing, living in bliss. You know, like living in a cave, might as well have been living in a cave. Mm -hmm. And um, um, a few of my friends came over to have an intervention with me. And they said, dude, all you do is sit around and meditate. And I was like, I know, it's amazing. <laughs> They're like, no, you actually have to go back to work. You actually have to like do something with your life. Um, why don't you teach people to meditate? And I was like, come on, guys, I'm from Queens. I don't care about any of this meditation. <laughs> Um, so, uh, they were like, well, don't think of it altruistically. Think about like, if you really want to learn something, learn to teach it. Mm. So why don't you become, you know, a teacher? And so they said, you know, you're, um, I bumped into Deepak Chopra. I'd gone right after 9-11, I'd gone to a, uh, a meditation retreat in Oxford, England. There were supposed to be thousands of people, but no one was flying because of 9-11. So there, there were only 50 of us there. And so, um, it was really, you know, um, I didn't know this, but attending that course was um, requirement number one for being certified um, by Deepak. And I was like, mm -hmm. okay. So they said, there's a part two. You could go right now to the trip center. There'll be like a thousand people there. You'll get your part two and then you'll get certified. And then you'll like, you know, and I was like, I don't care about anyone else's meditation. I don't want to teach anybody else. Honestly, I just want to take my meditation to the next level. Mm -hmm. Let me learn, you know, meditation from the inside out. So I went to this event in, um, in California. Um, and um, there weren't a thousand people there. There were only 30. And it was at that event. Um, they were asking everybody what they did, you know, in a previous life and what, what you do. And I was like, oh, um, I sort of like turn around companies. That's sort of like kind of what I do. And so in the middle of a meditation on day two, um, Deepak approached me and um, said like, hey, we've got our like CFO here and our CEO, you know, Dr. David Simon, my partner, and maybe you'd want to work with us. And so I was like, oh, okay. Anyway, a bunch of back and forths. And um, that day I was offered the job to run the Chopra Center um, to be its COO. And um, so now I have like two parts of the meditation thing. I stayed there, got certified, um, helped turn that business around, um, ultimately became the lead educator there. And then I was appointed the Dean of Chopra Center University. And um, every day I either taught meditation or studied, really got taken under the wings of Deepak Chopra and Dr. David Simon, uh, who were like my deep mentors at the time. And I uh, got to apprentice under them for a decade. And uh, that sort of like put me on my path. At a certain point, I was like, you know what? Time to leave, time to like fly out of the nest, do something on my own. And uh, so I began teaching in hospitals, in prisons, in schools, began teaching members of the military, uh, began working with law enforcement, started my own teacher training. Um, and that's what I've done for the last, uh, that was 2012 when I sort of mm -hmm. launched out and uh, here we are.
you know, a decade later. I seem to like the role in decades. Um, and so decade later, this is what I do. I teach people to connect to the stillness and silence that rests within so they can make better choices in their life. Mm. I have so many questions around your journey. I did see, um, I did read about Chopra Center, I think right around 2012 when you left and we are, we love the journey that you've taken on, on your oh, own. Oh, 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 so, the name. So after I'm working, you know, <laughs> yeah, I go down rabbit holes a lot. So, um, no worries. I like that. And so after like a few weeks of, of working at the Chopra Center with Dr. David Simon, really being like attached to his hip, he's the guy who really opened the door to me for, for Buddhist teachings and Sufi teachings. And, you know, we would read back and forth the Bhagavad Gita to each other every day. And he opened my eyes to, to Sanskrit and heart opening and, you know, just like a, a whole bunch of stuff that I had not really been spending a lot of time on in my mm -hmm. life. And um, I'm hanging out in my office one day. There was like, David's office, Deepak's office, and I was sort of like right next to them. And suddenly they both come in and they go, um, hi, um, we have a bit of an issue here. Um, <laughs> we, need to, we need to change your name. And we've decided your new name is David G. And I said, why? And my name was, was, was at the time David. And they said, yeah, we've decided to change your name from um, David to David G because David Simon, every time someone says David, you both whip your heads around and they're really probably looking for you. And he's, you know, finding it irritating. So I was like, okay, you're naming me because someone is being irritated. I get that. And so um, I said like David G, like in 12 step programs, you know, where you put in the, the last initial after and they go, no, no, D David J I, because in Hindi J I means beloved. And I went, oh, that's so perfect because my mother named me David because in the Bible, that means beloved. So I'll be beloved, beloved. And um, wow. that was uh, 2003, July 14th, Bastille Day, uh, mm -hmm. Liberation Day. And uh, so I was like, okay. And I've kept that name ever since that. Changed all my IDs and my credit cards and it's pain in, pain in the neck when you buy something online because they're always looking for a last name. It's just like, I'll put in like meditation as my last name or a period or space bar, something like that. But that's that's how I've rolled since, uh, I guess, for, for 20 years now. You don't have a last name. You you let go your last name. Yeah, sort of like Rihanna. <laughs> <laughs> and Madonna. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and Madonna. Um, <laughs> this know, is... Whatever. Wow, that's incredible. It's so funny. Jennifer Young is like hearing the story for the first time as well. I'm kind of stunned. And part of me, I was like, oh, can I actually ask the question? Um, I was thinking G maybe means teacher, uh, someone you look up to, almost like Sifu or in Chinese. And yeah, David G makes uh, a lot of sense. I noticed that during our live session, you know, with 150 other people, just less than a week ago, there are also people who are trying to ask you the question or trying to pronounce it correctly. And it was fascinating. I, I love the origin story. Thank you so much for sharing that with us. And I, and I don't really care what people call me, you know, mm -hmm. uh, lots of people call me David. And it's like, listen, my mom called me David. So I'm, I'm okay with someone calling me David. Um, some people call me Daviji. I'm like, okay, <laughs> that sounds cool. I'll, I'll take Daviji. Um, but you know, the people who are really, really close to me call me DG. So mm. that's sort of like my, my, my nickname. So DG. a lot of my students that have studied with me or people who've hung out with me, um, call me DG or just G. G. Wow. But you know, in, in, um, in all these deep, um, ancient, um, wisdom traditions, you never call yourself G. That's something someone else calls you. You know, mm -hmm. so the fact that I am David G really bristles some people because, mm -hmm. you know, it, to a certain extent, it means like revered one. And like, who am I to be calling myself revered one? So that's why I made it David G with a small D instead of a capital D because I'm not the beloved, I'm mm -hmm. a beloved. Mm, the beloved, I love it. And I think I have a few Japanese friends who always introduce me to others or even their kids as face on Vansa. It's just really interesting adding that to the name. It actually feels very different. And I 
love, I've taken notes based on a lot of your teachings. And one of the things you said recently in front of a crowd is living on a higher vibration. And something about it that I just love because I would love for you to say uh, more about it because I think I interpret it in my own way. And just by hearing that phrase just makes me feel at ease, um, like I'm walking on cloud or something. Um, yeah. What does it mean to you? Well, highest vibration always wins. And what mm -hmm. does that mean? It's actually a property in physics. It's called entrainment, right? We see it with um, dolphins traveling in a pod. You know, they all entrain each other. They send out these, they, you know, beep, 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 sending out all these signals. Mm -hmm. And uh, the rest of the pod just flows with them. We see it in, in birds in flight, uh, certainly pelicans and Canadian geese when they're flying in a V formation. Uh, there's one at the head, you know, he's pulling the weight for everyone else when he or she gets tired, travels to the back and then drafts, you know, on the collective and, and just pull, pulls along. We see it with, um, I don't know, we, we see it with, uh, with ducklings and, and geese, the baby geese, the baby ducklings, you know, they're following close behind. If the, if the duck, you know, or swan or whatever heads off in another direction, most of them will just like curve. There's always one who's going to straggle off into some way, but entrainment is real. And suddenly whoosh, they get pulled mm -hmm. along. So um, everything is energy and the highest vibration always wins. And if we can cultivate our own internal vibration, then we will raise the world around us. And if there are others who are vibrating at a higher level than we are, let's surrender and allow them to bring us up. We know what low vibration is. Low vibration is when you're, you know, living um, in, in a state of, of trauma uh, or pain or um, you're tired or lazy or high. Uh, or sick mm. and we know what low vibration is we can see it you know if other people are are living from a place of um, fight or flight or um, you know have deeply seated anger and so I believe that through um, not just meditation because meditation alone I don't believe really accomplishes what we want it to accomplish. Meditation alone really helps you on a physiological basis, you know, lowers your heart rate, lowers your pulse. We know uh, the benefits that it brings to your um, autonomic nervous system and to your um, prefrontal cortex, which is our executive decision-making. Um, mm -hmm. You know, we know all those, those benefits. Um, helps you sleep better at night, perhaps makes you a little more patient, but I believe also studying the ancient wisdom teachings helps us formulate a code that we live life by. And, you know, all these ancient teachings tell us to level up, mm -hmm. you know, to yoga stakuru karmani, get still and then be brilliant. And so I believe that we all can be on a quest to raise our vibrations you know, consistently, just elevate, 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 maybe not one day after another, but, you know, uh, ideally we're vibrating at a higher level than we were last week or last month. Mm -hmm. And I believe that's a journey that we all take. And I think that combined with a daily meditation practice is like, pff, that really gives us, you know, all the, all the stuff that we need to awaken um, our best expression, our best version, which is always inside of us, but often dormant. Mm -hmm. No, I love what you're saying here because I remember just first hearing your voice. I think I was in, not only I was in a unique situation and was kind of stressed out working on consulting in 2016, but something about your voice just picked me up. Uh, there's a level of authenticity that is kind of indescribable. So I do encourage people to find your voice anywhere they can find it. I love whichever recording studio you're in. It just, it really amplifies uh, your voice without manipulating it, if that makes sense. Um, but I, I also want to inquire the fact that it's something that I feel like personally I struggle with, that I have reached a point where there is financial stability. I live in a comfortable home. I feel safe and I'm I can support my mom, pay her bills. I'm just like, operating at a level I never thought it was possible. And I get to work on projects related to childhood cancer, palliative care, 
all the things that I truly care about and I know makes a difference. Yet, an Inside Timer Summit is this Saturday that I've been working tirelessly around the clock for the past month. But I still find myself first thing in the morning checking my phone. Um, I'm working a lot of hours. I'm meditating very inconsistently, usually when I go to sleep, uh, before I go to sleep. And I wonder, energy wise, I just I find you as someone who can read people really easily. So I love to use myself as a guinea pig of a lot of people in my situation, knowing that they should relax more, finding their higher vibrations. Um, uh, there are certain aspects of myself I'm not sure if I love, which is the overworking, the overstimulated, um, sometimes dissatisfied with progress uh, version of myself. And? And I would like to change that. Even that means baby steps and paying attention to self-care. But I think people misinterpret self-care. I'm not sure. Like self-care is this umbrella statement. It's like, how do I actually achieve that? How do I know that now in my late 30s, I, want to, I really want to make a difference as opposed to, oh, when is it? Ever, when right. is this ever enough? Well, I don't know. I, I don't know when it's ever enough. I, I don't know. You know, well, you'll take your last breath and then you'll go, oh, you know, I guess it's enough. Um, so, so I don't know that that we that we that we want to go like uh, done. Okay, uh, it's gonna take me away. But you know, let's look at that. You know, the, the 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 thing we should not be seeking is to be stoners sitting on a couch and and streaming all day long. I mean, that's fun. I love it. I try to I try to get at least four hours of TV a day. Um, but um, I think it's very important, actually. Um, but you know, so here you need to put your head down, Faye. You know, this summit is important to you, and it's going to touch perhaps you know, hundreds of thousands of people, and then be something that's that's you know that's that's up on the um, Insight Timer um, platform or dashboard for for a while to come. I'm guessing. I don't really know mm -hmm. anything about it. And you know what their plans are for it in the future, um, mm -hmm. but then when you're done, when you've put in that last keystroke, mm -hmm. that's when you need to. That's when you need to celebrate. Mm -hmm. So the answer isn't like I should back off because that's like a really hard thing, and I've been really working really hard. Mm -hmm. It's um, uh, Bhagavad Gita, chapter two, verse forty-seven says we have total control over our own actions and no control over the fruit of those actions. So the mm -hmm. ancient teachings truly tell us like, oh, um, guess what? Um, show up and do the thing for the thing's sake, not mm -hmm. with your concern about the outcome of that. Mm -hmm. A great translation by this guy. This is the Bhagavad Gita, as it is by A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada. You know, um, his translation of chapter two, verse forty-seven contains a line that I've, I've I've never seen in anyone else's translation, and I've read hundreds of different translations, you know, of, uh, of the Gita. Um, never consider yourself the cause of the results of your actions, and never be attached to inaction. So there are three things: don't get caught up in the fruit since you have no control over the fruit, never consider yourself the cause of the results of your actions. Essentially show mm -hmm. up and do your work selflessly without, you know, and number three, never be attached to inaction. So these ancient teachings don't tell us to like sit in a cave, you know, mm -hmm. and like let the world go by. These ancient teachings tell us, apply yourself, lean in hard, do your work. Yoga Stakuru Karmani, get still and then be brilliant and then let it go whatever you've done you know mm -hmm. it's like a, it's like a kiss mm. you know it's like a kiss we could want to like lay a kiss on someone and we could feel that passion burning in our toes and it moves up into our ankles and then into our legs and then into our <laughs> hips and it's like building up that that passion for that kiss it's getting steamy as it moves into our into our torso and then moving up towards our lips and it's getting hotter and hotter and hotter and then we lay that kiss on we don't control what happens on the other side of that kiss. Someone could check their watch or someone could swoon. We don't control that. We only control the kiss. So bring the best kiss possible. And I'd say, show up and do your best mm -hmm. and then celebrate that you've done all the hard work and um, let go of outcomes. Mm. Mm. Oh, just need to take a moment for 
all that to sink in. Um, it is so liberating to hear that because you're right. Uh, in the past year, I've been told to help, help moderate and teach people how to run Zoom memorials and Zoom uh, funerals. I I was so nervous. It wasn't. It was unlike any other events, and there were a lot of needs and and all that could things could go wrong. But you're right. Just by showing up, which is according to Seth Godin, is 99% of the work. Whatever the outcomes, like why attach ourselves to it? Why anticipate it so much? So it, in a way that paralyzes us. Yeah. And we can use meditation as a tool to help us introduce a pattern interrupt. So when we find ourselves talking harshly or not being kind to ourselves or beating ourselves up or not applying the self-care that we actually need, mm -hmm. you know, whether that's walking outside in nature, whether that's getting a massage, whether that's retail therapy, whether that's singing a song or dancing around or whether that's getting going off into some creative area, you know, whatever that is. Um, we need to celebrate. We spend so much time in the yeah. alternative to that. When stuff goes wrong, oh my God, we get so wrapped up in the, oh my God, I suck. You know, and then we beat ourselves up and it replays and we ruminate and it goes on forever. We need to offset some of it, at least with a little nice job. So let me be the first to tell you, even though you're not just, you're not finished yet. Congratulations, Faye. What a great job you've done on the Inside Timer Summit. I love it. I have a meeting with Maddie in a few hours. I'm going to celebrate with her even before the event. And it's so true. There is yes, so much to celebrate. Course. All the videos are done. All the, ah, everything is so beautifully done. And we're looking for every last error and all that. But, oh my God, thank you. Thank you, David G. It means so much for that to come from you. And you're going to be uh, an event that I absolutely look forward to for the summit. You mentioned something, pattern interrupt. I have to interrupt you by bringing that up because ever since you noticed in, in a conversation with me, I was trying to recall some details and then it went away and it came back. Literally within a few days of that, I saw in live action on Zoom, it happened to so many other people. Could you explain to us what pattern interrupt means and how people can maybe use that to their advantage? It's just a break in the action. It's just a time in, mm -hmm. which was a term coined by Andy Kelly, the Boston Buddha, dear friend of mine. Um, we think that the harder we concentrate, the better the solution will be. And that can that can work to a certain extent. Maybe in the you know in the first few steps of trying mm -hmm. to find the solution, maybe we set the trajectory. Um, but at a certain point, when we hit that that blockage or that constriction, or and we all do in so many different ways, we can't find the right words, uh, or we can't find the right solution, or we're sort of like lost in the path, literally and figuratively, you know, of of our journey in life. Um, we think, well, let me, let me work harder. I mean, we were trained that that's, that's really what the problem is. We were, we were trained that in our society, wherever you grew up, that's what they, as you came out of the womb, they whispered into your ear. Okay. Here's how it works. Focus and effort. All right. If it's not working, focus more, still not working more effort. That's it. That's what we were taught. And now get out there. But the reality is that's not how our brain works. You know, our brain gets tighter and tighter and tighter and tighter and tighter. And what's supposed to happen, we're like, these things are supposed to come together. But as we get tighter and tighter and tighter, it's like these things are coming together. And we're like, that's not firing accurately. There's some disconnect there. And mm -hmm. if we can take a pattern interrupt of some sort, oh, what's that over there? Then we come back mm -hmm. how we're supposed to. So introducing a break in the action helps us choose another outcome. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> you know, in between stimulus and response, there is a space, Viktor Frankl, famous quote, in that space rests our ability to choose. In that choice lies our freedom. So if you go into the refrigerator or the freezer at 11 o'clock at night to, you know, tank up on some ice cream, just taking a pattern interrupt, which could be, we'll do it right here. Close your eyes right now and take a long, slow, deep breath in through your nose and watch it go down into your belly, hold it when it gets there and just watch it, keep holding it, keep observing it, keep witnessing it. 
And now release that breath and watch it as it moves up your chest, through your throat, out through your nose or your mouth. Keep exhaling and keep watching that breath. Keep observing it. Keep holding it out until it dissipates into the ether. And now breathe normally, open your eyes. So in those 16 seconds, that was 16 seconds, by the way, or about somewhere between 15 and 17. In those 16 seconds, if you were playing along and you were playing along, um, you weren't thinking about that other thing. So if we can do something like that right before we go deep on some, you know, Ben and Jerry's at 11 o'clock at night, which we never need. Um, if we can do that right before we, you know, drink something or get high or do whatever, you know, or eat the second dessert, you know, we, we can go on and on with, with how we can apply this, certainly in a recovery situation or a 12 step program, um, you know, something that we're addicted to, but also in how we respond and how we treat other people and how we, converse with other people. If we can just take a break, we'll be better listeners of life. We'll listen to that, that space inside where we have a choice. It's like, oh, I don't need to eat ice cream at 11 o'clock at night. I don't need to cut that person off while they're speaking. I could listen to them finish their sentence. Maybe there's something special that will happen there. We can apply this in so many different ways to so many different situations. And um, and we've all done that. We've all been like watching TV and we're like, oh my God, it's that guy, that, that actor. He's the guy who was in that thing. And what's the name of that movie that he was in? I don't even remember that. He was in that thing with that other guy. And suddenly someone says, hey, you want a, uh, some liquid? Like, yeah. <laughs> oh, Ray Liotta, you know? So it's like, boom, by actually pulling back and stepping away, mm -hmm. whatever that constriction was just eases up a little bit and allows us to come together a little more elegantly with our next thought, with our next action, with our next choice mm. in life. What, I love that. And I feel like it's a, we can build it in very consciously taking, who doesn't have 15 seconds uh, to take two breath. And I love, I have a little trampoline uh, at home and I love it. It's from Bellicon. As German made, and I remember just even bouncing on it for for a few minutes, and then coming back to work, I feel like a very different person. Same thing with stretching, or we're playing, picking the guitar. I'm not very good at it, but just play for five minutes, and then going back to whatever the work I'm doing uh, is very transformative. But what's the difference between, um, yeah, pattern pattern interrupt versus distractions or lack of focus? Like how do we? Uh, how do we help young people or older people, uh, older adults understand the differences? Yeah, well, you know, sometimes distractions are helpful, sometimes mm -hmm. they're not. But again, when we're bringing all our energy to find the solution, to do this thing, mm -hmm. and we're stuck, well, that's the time for a pattern interrupt. Mm -hmm. That's the time for a break mm -hmm. in the action. We need to give our brain a breath. Mm -hmm. You know, so that when we recollect, we, re we recollect with a greater intention or, you know, a higher likelihood of actually accomplishing, mm -hmm. you know, our goal. Um, mm -hmm. Don't confuse that with sadness that's in your heart and running away from it or a very, very, you know, difficult decision that you have and just, you know, putting it off, putting it off, putting it off. You know, that's why I believe meditation can be such a powerful tool uh, for that practice because it gives us just, you know, just that moment allows us to recognize that we are indeed the space between. And mm. so um, in that space, our next choice could be anything. If we don't allow that space, then our next choice is something from our conditioned bag of tricks. It's like, these are the five ways I respond and that's it. How do we mm -hmm. solve a problem like that? It's only gonna be one of those five solutions. Mm -hmm. You know, and mm -hmm. usually it's one. It's like our default, you know, when, when this happens, I do that. So how do we like expand our repertoire when we do that by connecting to the stillness and the silence that rests within, even if that's 16 seconds, do that four times, it's a minute, do that 20 times, it's five minutes. That could be the foundation of an entire meditation practice. Mm -hmm. That could be your ability to really connect to something so special. Mm -hmm. um, but you don't know unless you're willing to go there. And that's why a lot of people say, well, I don't have time. No, you specifically 
do have time. Mm -hmm. You don't have time to not bring in other possibilities. We're either going to live a conditioned life and then die, or we're going to live a life of infinite possibilities where we keep exploring and growing. We're going to die too. But like you get a choice, you know, do you want it to be like this full and rich, or do you want it pe to be stale and the same thing it was yesterday? Mm -hmm. mm. It's a choice. Everybody gets to choose that. You know, it's not. Mm. You know, I love it. You don't have time to not explore other possibilities. Um, with that said, my goodness, you know, I'm going to show you some hearts. Uh, thank you so much for anyone who is watching us. Absolutely love it. And I'm going to bring up a topic that is so important because I have a lot of chocolate at home and I love, always love chocolates. We can even riff on Oh, speaking of which, oh, I was just thinking I have to send you, I have to send you, David G, some of my favorite chocolates, if that's okay with you. And yeah, <laughs> it's, it's, a, it's a, one of those things that I never say no to, you know, people you... give me, send me, people send me chocolate and t-shirts. That's, mm. that's, those are the two gifts that I'm always receiving. And I always encourage people keep doing that. I'll wear the t-shirts <laughs> and I'll, and I'll eat the chocolate. <laughs> this face world t-shirt with uh have you tried la burdick before i've not oh my goodness okay that's it all right done um i want you to talk about chocolate meditation for anybody who's watching right now oh my god what a treat i have no idea what that is but i'm all for it, it sounds like a great idea to me yeah well um it's particularly great for someone who's never meditated it's definitely great for for you know, a kid, but it's also great for a geezer. You know, it doesn't matter whether you're nine or 90, you can, you know, you can do a chocolate, chocolate meditation. And the beauty is, you know, normally in any other meditation, um, for thousands of years, there's always been some kind of anchor or object of our attention. Uh, in mindfulness practices, it's, you know, paying attention to what is or following our breath or drifting our attention to a body part, to a body scan or something along those lines. You know, the meditations, it's a mantra. Uh, there are open-eyed drishti meditations where we put our attention on, you know, some external um, object. There's walking meditations. There's so many different types of objects of our attention. But imagine if you could take, and uh, obviously it's better with high quality chocolate, but obviously if you could take a piece of chocolate, even if you took a piece of Hershey's, you know, if you're going to slum it, you know, on that, it's okay. Same thing happens. Um, but you, um, you use that as the anchor, you use that as the object of your attention. And you settle in because, you know, comfort is queen, always comfort is queen, always keep moving towards comfort during your practice. And you close your eyes and you begin this whole thing. If it's wrapped, you just stay there and you spend time. And, and what's the object of your attention? The sound of the unwrapping or the crinkling of whatever it's wrapped in. If it's unwrapped, you know, or as soon as it becomes unwrapped, then it's about the aroma and your eyes are closed and you're probably going to drift away to thoughts or sounds or physical sensations. And then you come back to the aroma and then you break a little piece off if you can, and then place that in your mouth and just hang out. Don't, don't yomp, yomp it. Obviously East coasters are always going to like chew it really quick, just like they bite Tic Tacs. But if, the, if there's someone else out there. You know, just allow that to sit in your mouth. And what happens is your body temperature begins to heat whatever that chocolate is. And it begins to soften and then liquefy. And so as the texture is changing, so is the flavors changing. And so, yes, you're going to drift away to all this other stuff. You just keep coming back to that whole transformation of the chocolate and you stay there until it's like fully liquefied and run down your throat. And then you, you know, do the rest of it the same way. And you could stretch that out for like 10 minutes. Most of the time, especially I was trained, you know, in, in New York, here's how you eat a piece of chocolate. Oh, piece of chocolate, yomp, done. That's like, who could even enjoy it at that point? You know, you enjoyed it for like a flicker of a second. You spend time with a piece of chocolate for 10 minutes. Um, that's sort of like a precursor and a great start mm -hmm. to mindful eating, which mm -hmm. most of us don't really eat mindfully. Um, mm -hmm. We read while we're eating or we argue or talk or watch TV or something along those lines. Mm -hmm. um, but 
having a chocolate meditation and you're like, oh, I don't have 10 minutes to eat a piece of chocolate. Like that's the whole issue. Of course you do. Of course you do. You're just not giving yourself permission to take 10 minutes, you know, um, with some of the most famous people in the world and successful people in the world are meditators. You know, you know, Steve Jobs is a meditator, Oprah's a meditator, um, you know, so many people, you know, who are like successful and they're practicing in the morning and in the afternoon. So if they could spend 20 minutes here or a half hour there or 15 minutes there, you could spend 10 minutes eating a piece of chocolate. So mm -hmm. I think that really can teach us so many different types of ways to like, you know, celebrate ourselves. Hmm. Wow. I think this is resonating with our live audience, but soon to be heard, uh, I'm going to create these clips. It's celebrating ourselves, celebrating our time together. I, I was so tempted to do it. These are not even the best chocolate. I just, I have to go through this practice. And I have to say that David G sounds like you're also an expert in, um, uh, chocolate, maybe food in general. Now I'm curious, what are your go-to chocolates that, that gives you so much joy and what's actually in your, in your cart? You mentioned at the grocery store, people like to take pictures of your cart. Now I'm interested in what's actually inside. It's, it's nothing exciting. It's just people intruding on my life. So there's nothing really exciting in my cart. Um, but they're like, oh, you eat that. Oh, I thought you, you know, were this. I'm plant strong, but I'm not plant perfect. So suddenly, if you know, you find me eating a pizza or it better be a really good pizza, um, you know, so, yeah, most of the time I'll default to like cauliflower crust or something like that, you know, mm -hmm. with no cheese. Um, but people are, you know, people are just curious. You know, I remember I had a, a one out on my Hay House radio show. I got to interview like everybody, you know, so I interviewed, you know, Deepak and Don Miguel and, you know, Barbara DeAngelis and Cheryl Richardson and. Mary and Williamson, you know, like so many, so many people. And I remember Barbara DeAngelis and I, we went so deep into the ancient teachings for like an hour. Mm. We, you know, we explored the Bhagavad Gita and the teachings of the Buddha and, and Patanjali and, and the Maharaji, like all this deep, deep stuff. And at the end of that, I got an email from someone that's like, loved your conversation with Barbara. Um, is she a vegan and do you drink coffee? I'm like, that's really? That's your takeaway? That was, we spoke for an hour, a solid hour and that's what you took away? What, what did we eat and you know drink? Um, <laughs> you know, too hysterical, too hysterical. And so, um, you know, people are just curious about, you know, what other people do. Um, obviously, you know, I live in, in Carlsbad, California, which is 40 miles from north of Mexico, about 115 miles south of LA, um, mm -hmm. about five miles, from the Pacific Ocean, Sweet Mama O, and about 3,000 miles from you, Faye, 3,000 miles from, from Boston and, and, and New York. <clears throat> and there's a place here called the French Bakery, and they make the most amazing chocolate truffles that are like dusted with cacao powder. So even on that one, there's like the bitterness of the cacao powder to even before you even get to the chocolate. So very mm. intense. Mm, I have to try out all these brands. They're... On your website, you should absolutely list your favorite uh, chocolates of, you know, I feel like you have really embraced <laughs> all the possibilities there for sure. Um, I want to respect your time and I know we can talk forever, but there's one area I just wonder if other people ever think about, which is your, my goodness, your, what is the word for it? Knowledge and deep expertise and comfort with Sanskrit and I never heard anyone, not even frankly, just people from India, people who have studied, um, uh, who are yogi or have studied the culture so deeply. I've rarely heard people uh, outside of that training, that culture to be able to, to speak so comfortably. And I always feel really quite blown away by it. So did you always learn languages very easily or did you put an enormous amount of uh, effort into learning, reading, writing? Um, no, I'm not really, a, you know, I'm not great with, with a lot of languages. I speak a few languages really horribly, mm -hmm. um, you know, mixed, mixed in with a lot of, you know, queens. Um, <clears throat> but um, Sanskrit, uh, I fell in love with Sanskrit you know, about a little, maybe 25 years ago, um, mm. just because, 
you know, the Sanskrit is not spoken. Sanskrit has not been spoken for 500 years oh. as a conversation. You know, it was the primary language on the Indian subcontinent, you know, for thousands of years. And um, now that's been replaced, it's not, it's not ever spoken now um, and hasn't since, I don't know, 1300s perhaps. Um, but now it's been replaced by, I think like 85 other dialects. You know, mm -hmm. so whether that's Hindi or whether that's uh, Tamil or whether that's, um, you know, Bengali, you know, so many different dialects in there. And so I love the fact, you know, that's why, that's why I like going back to the ancient wisdom traditions, because it's not about, it's not about politics and it's not about, you know, culture wars and it's not about any of that. This is like the source material that existed, you know, so far before, you know, all, all this other stuff. Mm -hmm. And um, it's not the language of the Buddha. The language of the Buddha is Pali, P-A-L-I. But, uh, you know, Sanskrit has been going on, you know, since, since right around, you know, before then um, as well. And so the beauty of Sanskrit is that all the ancient teachings um, have a Sanskrit sort of correlation, at least, um, whether they're written in Sanskrit or whether they're written in a variation. Um, of, of Sanskrit. And of course, there's even within the Sanskrit world, there's classical Sanskrit versus, you know, more expanded Sanskrit, um, like anything else, there's fundamentalists, not fundamentalists. Um, but I really, you know, I love that language because that language is like the foundation of so many words that we have in the English language. So it's mm -hmm. not that it's like, oh, it's this weird thing, you know, because we think so nonchalantly about Latin and Greek as like, oh, these are the foundational elements. Oh, au contraire. You know, Sanskrit is the foundation for so much that we that we speak. You know, the, the word for fire, well, there's 14 words for fire in Sanskrit, but, you know, the word that, that gets, you know, talked about so much, certainly in Ayurveda, um, is Agni, A-G-N-I, Agni, which means your digestive fire. It's not the element of fire, you know. Mm -hmm. um, uh, the element of fire is tejas. You know, if there's like a fire coming out of my palm, I'd say, behold, tejas. So it's not that. Um, but, you know, agni is, is our digestive fire. It cooks all of our food and it cooks all of our emotions and it cooks all of our life experiences. And, you know, we get the word ignite, ignition from a simple word like agni. And suddenly you realize, mm. oh, there's like a whole bunch of stuff that we use in our, in our basic um, English and French and Spanish uh, Romance language parlance, which is not directly coming from from Latin or Greek. In fact, so much of Latin and Greek comes from even Sanskrit, which um, which informed those languages as well. So I think Sanskrit's fun. It's cool. It's got people who are like fundamentalists about no, here's how you pronounce it. Here's how you pronounce it, and uh, which I always think is you know very entertaining. And people are getting all feisty about <laughs> stuff, like, stuff like that. Um, but um, yeah, uh, Sanskrit's, you know, it's, I, I never really studied it deeply until I met Dr. David Simon. So it's only been 20 years that I've been really like exploring it and, and, um, and really diving deeper into mm -hmm. the ancient wisdom traditions. Um, and the beauty of Sanskrit is there's a lot, leaves a lot to translation, mm. which means it's it, the foundation for so much creativity that we can, you know, come away with, you know, we live in an age of fundamentalism, like people like that about the constitution, you know, like, well, no, it's, a, here's what they meant in 1778 when they wrote the constitution. How do we know what they meant? You know, <laughs> so like, suddenly it's like, you know, here's what this means and here's what that, means. you know, we could say that about the Bible, the New Testament, the Old Testament, the Quran, the constitution, you know. but um, Sanskrit, you know, leaves a lot to interpretation and we get to expand it in our more modern times. Mm -hmm. And so it's one, that's one of the beautiful things that I, that I see in that. I it's so beautiful when you speak it because to me it sounds like your native tongue it sounds so natural uh like your first language almost and i love repeating after you which is a practice that you do you know you help people to repeat practice after you and then your voice fades away and it's just us and there's sometimes i literally you explain what it means and very quickly within seconds i've completely forgotten 
what it means. And I realize it doesn't matter at all. And there is a certain feeling associated with these words that are sometimes, you know, I say, I can't find a word for, I can't find a feeling that can be attached to this word, but somehow, especially when I feel like I'm in trenches, um, you know, you've, you, everybody loses themselves. And then that those words and your voice could pull us back in. It's really magical and so fun. Well, I, you know, I like teaching other people to do this stuff too, you know, to mm -hmm. use like mantras like Om Moksha Vitam, um, or, you know, to use other words that, you know, we can use uh, symbolically or mm -hmm. metaphorically um, in our lives. And yet at the same time, um, we can use them just for their vibration, not for their meaning at all. Mm -hmm. Because at the vibrational level, we know their meaning. So forget language. It's just like, what a beautiful vibration that we can repeat. And that's really why I, I like using Sanskrit in, in mantras because no one is speaking it. I don't care who you meet. No one grew up speaking. It doesn't matter. No one on this planet grew up speaking Sanskrit. And so everyone who meditates using Sanskrit can use it for its vibrational quality as opposed to its meaning of any sort. Mm, wow. There's so much like freedom to this as opposed to, like you said, oh, French, you have to speak a certain way. Chinese, very serious or English. These are all grammatically wrong. But then Sanskrit is just learning, having fun and applying our own interpretations. Oh, my goodness. I could talk. I could go on forever, but uh, I have to respect your time, David G. And I want to send all anyone who's watching this to check out all your books, please, and your meditation, which is available pretty much everywhere, YouTube, Spotify. If you're like me who loves the Inside Timer app, please follow David G there. Um, before I let you go, David G, is there something that you feel like we should talk about but I haven't brought up yet that you want the audience to know? Yeah, yeah. Uh, first of all, I believe that we transform the world by transforming ourselves. So that's, that's really important. We spend a lot of time pointing at stuff outside of ourselves and getting all worked up over it. And whether that's something in politics, whether that's something in you know social um, aspects, um, the Bhagavad Gita teaches us that we should be activists. All of us should be activists in life. But it also teaches us get still first. If you just suddenly start yelling at the top of your lungs, no one's listening to that anyway. And if you're going to point at all these things that are wrong over the course of the world, and we could all probably pick five things really, really quickly that, that, that suck on the planet. But we have nothing to do with them. We can't influence them. We can't really impact them. I mean, if you want to fly to Ukraine, you could start working, you know, as an activist to help people mm -hmm. or fly to Poland. You can help people who are escaping from Ukraine. Yes, you can do that. But how about put your attention, like, what's the point of that if you're harsh to yourself? What's the point of that if you're mean or lose your temper with the people that you live with? Mm -hmm. So I believe we should always be thinking globally, but acting locally. And we have that ability to really act locally. Start with your own heart. And then, like, you know, radiate out a little bit to perhaps the people that you live with. And then perhaps, and you could spend years on that before you're worrying about something that's that sucks over here or over there or that person or that, you know. Um, so these ancient teachings don't tell us to be oblivious to, to what's around us, but they teach us like, put your attention on the thing you actually can make happen. And so I think it's more important that we're kind to ourselves, that we're forgiving to ourselves, that we're compassionate to ourselves, that we practice self-care and self-love, and then ripple that ever so slowly out to those in our front row in our immediate circle and then let that ripple continue to move out because it's so easy for us to get caught up in the this political thing and that political thing with with such a divisive world and really are we going to change the opinions of, of people who are so firmly against what we're for probably not doesn't mean we shouldn't march <laughs> doesn't mean we shouldn't you know practice you know some some type of um civil disobedience if that's your lane mm -hmm. but what's the point of that if you're being so harsh to yourself and you're holding on to your pain and trauma and mm -hmm. you're allowing emotional leakage to to you know ripple out to all those people in your life mm -hmm. so i say you know pay attention to your side of the street 
there's a lot always going on on the other side of the street. Pay attention to your side of the street and and um, live from your heart. Live from your heart. Ah, this is so cool. Thank you. This is amazing. I have so much work to do in a very happy way. I don't feel a sense of obligation, uh, new things to explore, so much um, to take from this conversation. Thank you so much, David G. We love you so much and for all your teaching, for being you. I'm going to take us offline now. Um, please stay with me for just a minute.